Welcome to episode 287 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Christopher Bradley. He's an actor turned writer-director who just did an indie drama called The Trigger. He lives in Arizona and produced this movie there. We talk about that for a bit as well as his career as an actor and how that prepared him to write and direct this feature film. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 287. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I teach you how to write a professional log line and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. I just want to quickly mention the writers group that I am in. We're always looking to add good writers to the rotation. We meet every Tuesday at 7.15 p.m. until about 10 p.m. in Sherman Oaks, California, right around where the 405 and 101 intersect. There is also offshoots of this same writers group that meet on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday in North Hollywood. So if you're if those nights are better or you're closer to that, you can still check all of this out and it might work for you. Some of the schedules on those other groups might work for you, but this group, Deadline Junkies, now has a session Monday through Thursday. Here's how it works. Each week, three members member writers put up around 25 pages of a screenplay they're currently working on. The pages are read on stage by professional actors in front of the other writers in the group, and then the listening writers give notes to the presenting writer. As a member writer, you'll be putting up pages roughly every five weeks. It's a great way to workshop your material, network with other talented actors and writers, and hone your critical thinking skills by giving notes to these other writers. This is a live in-person event, so you need to live somewhere in the Sherman Oaks, California area to be able to attend weekly. Again, the other, um, the Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights are in North Hollywood, so you just have to be local to those areas and be able to get to those theaters. If you're not in the Los Angeles area, perhaps consider starting a writer's group of your own. Nearly every city in the world has a community of filmmakers and writers, and in most cases, they're just looking for someone to step up and be a leader and get things organized. The interview I'm da- doing today extra with Christopher, he talks a little bit about his development process and how he's in a um, writer's group that is based in Arizona. So I know these can work in all different cities, all different areas of the world. The one big stumbling block for people that um, want to be that want to join our groups, the Deadline Junkies group, is that you do have to be committed to showing up nearly every Tuesday or or whatever night the the group is meeting. Even when you're not up, you need to still be there so that you can give notes to the other writers. Obviously, if if you bring your pages in, you're going to want notes on, on your pages from the other writers. So that's how the group works. You show up even when you're not presenting. You give notes and then vice versa. That writer, when he's not presenting, he'll show up and he'll give notes to you. So that's the one big thing. You do have to be committed to showing up every week to um, to be a member of this um, of this writers group. If you'd like to learn more about the group, go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash writers group. And the word writers group is all one word and it's all lowercase, just sellingyourscreenplay.com slash writers group. I, of course, will add that to the show notes as well so you can click over to it. Quick few words about what I'm working on. I've been talking about my horror thriller mystery project that I'm trying to get going. Slowly but surely, I am starting to ramp this up. I've been starting to um, think about the Kickstarter campaign, which I'm hoping to run in August or September. A lot of stuff I need to think through before that. So these things do take time. And and like what I did with the pinch, I'm not going to rush things. I just I'm going to go slowly. This is going to be a low budget film, so I don't want to waste money. I don't have a lot of money to throw at this. So time is going to be the one thing that I kind of just give myself 
myself plenty of time to work through these various steps so that I can make sure they're done as as well as possible. I wrote a little script this week to um, for the short Kickstarter video, so that was kind of a good step. I'm hoping to bring one or two actors on before the Kickstarter campaign, and mainly I'm looking for actors who have large social media followings so that they can potentially really help out with the Kickstarter campaign. So I've started to reach out to some actors and look around for that. Obviously, they have to be right for the specific role, so that's been a challenge, but hopefully I'll be able to find um, one or two actors that would be a good fit for this. We have more than two-thirds of the money in play, so it's just about raising sort of that final one-third. That's really what we're looking for through this Kickstarter. I've been talking to some of the folks that I worked with on the pinch about locations, equipment, and crew, so that's, again, just sort of behind the scenes. I have been starting to take some of those meetings, and really it's not even meetings at this point. It's just phone calls and emails, just starting to get some of those things um, organized. And then once the Kickstarter campaign is ramped up and finished, we have our money, then um, pre-production will really start in earnest. So that's the next step, I would say, for this project. Get the Kickstarter in place, get that, run that, raise the money, and then um, from there we'll be um, in pretty good shape because then we'll have our money and we can just um, figure out um, when we're actually going to start shooting. So that's what I'm working on, um, and that's what I'll probably be working on here for the next few weeks and months. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing writer, director Christopher Bradley. Here is the interview. Welcome, Christopher, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thank you for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up, and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? <laughs> well, I, um, I grew up mostly in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, we, uh, we, I was one of eight kids, and um, when we moved to Albuquerque, Albuquerque was supposed to have this big economic explosion, and instead, the city just sprawled, and uh, it's always had a troubled uh, economy, um, and uh, we did not have enough money for eight kids, and uh, but I... We um, all got packed into the station wagon because uh, you could you had like a dollar a car deal in the in the '60s, and uh, so they took all the eight kids in the station wagon to see the Sound of Music. And I'm watching this movie, and it's like there's this huge family of kids, and they live in a mansion, and they're running around the countryside, and they're singing, and and uh, I was just like, oh my god, I want to go there. And uh, you know, of course, I'm seven years old, so I or. Uh, uh, we saw it in 1968. That's by the time it got to the uh, to the drive-in. Mm -hmm. But um, I couldn't quite separate out what was the children's real lives and what was uh, what was the movie. But I asked my mother, "How can you take me where I could get in a movie like that?" And uh, she said, uh, "Maybe when you're older." And I said, "Well, you take me when I'm eight, because when I'm eight, I'll be big." <laughs> um, and uh, um, but it it was probably the first time where I watched something and it was like something beyond my own life could happen. And I think watching movies um, really my whole life has been about like opening up compassion, opening up understanding, um, opening up possibilities like life could be this other way. Um, you could make these other choices. Um, and uh, uh, but really, right from then, I knew that I wanted to uh, to be in the movies. And I, I actually was looking over um, some old journals. I've kept a journal since I was 11 years old. And uh, it, when I was 18, I wrote down, I want to be a professional actor and I want to be a professional writer. And um, I teach right now as well. I teach uh, screenwriting at Arizona State. Okay. But one of the things I tell my students is have an idea where you want to go. And you don't necessarily end up there. You'll get close to it. It's like, ah, that's not quite where I want to go. I may want to go over here. I may want to go over here. But have a direction that you're moving. And um, I think with uh, seeing that movie as, as a small child and making some decisions when I was a teenager about what direction I wanted to go was very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. So then what were some of your first steps? So you saw this movie, you, you're 18, you want, to, you want to be a professional actor, professional writer. What are then some of those first steps to actually going out there and turning this into a career? Well, you, 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 I, I look back at my life and I feel like I, I have a very powerful guardian angel pounding me in the right direction. Because one of the, um, I did plays in grade school and um, 
uh, when I was in high school, though, by then I had become just terribly shy. And I knew that they were doing a, a musical production at school. And it was like, my heart's pounding. I can't breathe. It's like I couldn't possibly pull it together to go to an audition. And I w was at the bus stop waiting to go home. And these two um, girls that I was in school with came down to the bus stop and grabbed me and said, you're going to go in there and audition. And I don't know why. It's like did, my guardian angel must have told them to do this. And uh, I went in and gave what I thought was a pretty bad audition and uh, got in. Huh. And, uh, and, uh, and that experience, again, it was like that was the first time I performed in front of a large crowd. And again, it was that same feeling of like, I am home. I'm doing the right thing. This is where I need to be. And uh, I got a scholarship to, to, uh, to college, uh, to school, uh, Texas Christian University. And um, my first year, I was studying medicine. Um, I was going to do pre-med. And uh, I remember a friend of mine said, well, what, you, you want to be an actor. Why are you doing this? And it's like, no, I want to do something that matters. I want to do something that will you know, change the world. And he was like, movies change the world. Uh -huh. Like, what are you talking about? Like, of course they do. And, and you're good at it. And you're, you're, you're like, why would you go in another direction? And I... So I, I um, the next year I I uh, changed to a uh, to a theater major, and um, weirdly this is again like the these there's a combination of it. Everybody I think has a certain amount of luck. You have to combine the luck with good decisions as well. But one another piece of amazing luck, and I'll tell you a few, a few of them actually, but. Um, Texas passed one of those um, tax incentive laws while I was in school. So I'm in Fort Worth, which is about 30 minutes from Dallas, and all of a sudden they're building sound stages in Dallas. They're making movies in Dallas. They're making TV movies in Dallas. They're making commercials in Dallas. And the talent agencies suddenly needed a lot of people. And there was a director that I was in school with who uh, um, was interning at one of the agencies and told them, this guy's really good and you should sign him. <laughs> and uh, so um, they did. And uh, one of the first things I auditioned for was a, um, uh, was a uh, uh, low budget slasher movie. And um, uh, weirdly of all the things I've done, this was not, would not be the thing I would expect to get a Blu-ray release, but uh, about a year ago they did a Blu-ray yeah. release that brought me back to, to um, do an interview for the extras. And, uh, I just, um, it's a slasher movie. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't have a cult following. It's, it, it's a low budget slasher movie, but I watched it again and I was like, there's something so, no matter what the subject matter is, the energy of the film is so good. And that was again, a lesson for me. Like, like you, like something, there's something behind the story. There's some like films have ha, can have a goodness and a power that's even behind behind the scenes that's pushing something forward. Mm -hmm. And um, so after that, uh, when I graduated from college, uh, this is again combination of good luck and and good decisions. Um, so I met my at my um, the swimming pool of the apartment where I lived, and. Uh, one of the people who I was I lived in the apartment complex had gotten into a touring company of Pal Joey, a Broadway touring company. They were they were going across the country, and somebody dropped out, and they had local auditions, and he got in. So he invited one of the Broadway actresses to come to our to our swimming pool, and a friend of mine was like, "She's a Broadway actress. You should ask her. How you know? What do you do when you get to New York?" And I'm like, "I'm not going to talk to a Broadway actress." And again, grabbed me, pulled me over to her. And I got in a conversation with her, and she saw uh, my work in a in a play that I was doing at the time, and she said, "You're really good. My husband's a personal manager. If you move to New York, you should look him up." And she gave me his name and number. And I don't know if she thought I would do it, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> and I moved to New York uh, a few months after that, and uh, called him and auditioned for him, and he signed me, and uh, he uh, got me with a very powerful agent, and uh, then. They had an office out in L.A., so uh, when I moved from New York uh, to L.A., I already had, you know, because of the, because of the, um, 
because of the um, of the uh, uh, slasher movie, I was already in the unions. So I already had I had a powerful agent, and I was already in the unions when I got to L.A. And I was waiting tables with people who they were trying to get like one SAG point at a time, you know, for doing extra work, and you needed three hundred to get into SAG. Um, and uh, uh, so starting out in a small community like uh, Dallas Fort Worth like getting my cards there mm -hmm. was was um, uh, that turned out to be a really good thing because it's extraordinarily difficult to get um, to get into the unions once you're in LA yeah so. yeah for sure. So um, I'm, I'm curious on a couple follow-up questions. So you mentioned this feeling that you had when you were performing and it just felt right, like you were doing the right thing. Where do you think that comes from? Um, you know, why why does this get you jazzed as opposed to, you know, being a doctor? And I and I wonder too, you know, all these years later, are you glad that guy talked to you out of being, a, you know, going and being, being a doctor? Oh. <laughs> well, I'm very glad. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I think that there are many, many ways to be of service in the world. Um, I'm going to give you my crackpot theory. I actually think that that um, that in some ways people have a certain amount of hardwiring. Like you have a you're you're born with like a computer program that's that's more appropriate to one thing than another, and. Um, I think you'll talk to people who are, they just have a math mind, you know, and I just feel like I have always had a storyteller's mind. And as soon as I encountered storytelling, I was like, you know, like, like everything about my brain was like, was, was attracted to that. Um, I, I, um, I wanted to add something that, um, uh, with writing, um, I, uh, the first time I wrote a, um, the first time I wrote a screenplay, there was that with, with acting, somebody has to hire you. Somebody has to give you permission to do it. And when I wrote my first screenplay, I like got Sid Field's uh, screenwriting book um, uh, just to get the the, the very most basic uh, things. And it was again that sort of I remember my realizing that my face was burning as I was writing it, and I probably wrote the whole thing in about a month. And um, that, and I, I, when I was finished, I was just like, no one can stop me from doing this. <laughs> like, I don't have to get hired to do this. All I need is, you know, is a laptop and my brain and I can, and I can, and I can create. And that script, um, I showed it to a few people and it had, um, uh, it had uh, homosexuality in it and religious themes in it. And uh, so I showed it to a couple of independent producers and I was like, wow, you are, this is really good. No one wants this. <laughs> and um, so, I, so I put it in a drawer and I was like, you know, I'll wait, see if I can write something else. And I guess a couple of months later, I got a phone call out of nowhere and somebody said, is this script still available? And I was like, uh, yeah, it's still available. And a, a little production company optioned it. Huh. Uh, they didn't end up making it. They, uh, um, but that put it into my mind. If I, knowing as little as I know about screenwriting, if I could get a script option, maybe I ought to go to school. And um, I applied to the UCLA um, uh, screenwriting program and got in. Um, so there, you have to write a new screenplay every um, every sixteen weeks, and um, uh, so you're basically in in just this heavy heavy writing concentration and it teaches you not to be precious slam your first draft out you know you um you do a lot of planning before you actually start writing uh but again that sense of like the way my brain is put together is in perfect sync with how with how um screenwriting works with how mm -hmm. with uh, this kind of storytelling so okay, perfect. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I yeah. No, I think so. I think that's that's a great answer. Um, so, how do you think this decades? And, and I want to just get a little bit of the timeline. So, you've been acting for a number of years, and then you decide to write this screenplay, and that was your first foray, and it was a feature screenplay. Yes. Okay. And how many years had you been acting when you when you took that plunge and went to the UCLA um, program? Oh, uh, I started uh, acting professionally in '83, so that was. 
I went to UCLA in 98. So, um, you know, Over what is 10 that? 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm curious. Oh, and, and also about the acting too, like, one of the things that that um, one of the things that prepares you for writing and acting is you're looking at a screenplay. You're looking at story arcs. Like, what's my story arc? What's this other person's story arc? Um, even if you have a smaller part, every every role has a climactic moment. So you're like really looking at how how are these storylines mixing together, and what is the climactic moment that this character is building to. And if you're a good actor and a trained actor, you're already in a in a uh, writing structure mindset. Mm -hmm. So I feel like all of that homework I did on the acting prepared me for uh, for becoming a screenwriter. OK, perfect. Yeah. And that was sort of my next question. And I'd be curious. So then you started to do it looks like on your IMDb page, you have a number of shorts that you've written and directed as well. And so maybe you can talk about how did those prepare you for um, a feature film like The Trigger, um, just in terms of, you know, not just the experience, but maybe in the contacts and the promotion, just everything you can kind of tell us about how that got you ready for doing a feature. Um, great. Well, when I was in school, at UCLA, I um, uh, this was we were still uh, this was right as film was transitioning into digital. So I had a lot of um, I had a lot of classmates who were spending sixty, seventy thousand dollars on a short film, and uh, all my money was going into just going to school. <coughs> so I wanted to make a short film. So um, uh, there's an animation program. So I went to the head of the animation program and said, "How about letting me make?" An animated short film um, and that's like uh, it's like building your own house it's like sweat equity um, like I didn't have the money but I had I'm in school I have the time and I can you know and I'm an, I have a certain amount of uh, artistic talent and so while I was in school I first made um, I made a short with uh, cut paper um, it was cut paper glued to um, clear cells and that was shot on one of those old 1950s uh, animation cranes oh, wow. um, um, so you like you put the <clears throat> you put the pages down, you put the piece of glass over it, you snap twice, take it out, you have to change it. It took me about thirty six hours straight of sitting in that room drinking coffee to get that uh, uh, three minute short film made. Um, and then the second one, I scanned construction paper into the computer. And then I made something that looked like my cut paper film, but I did it in uh, After Effects. Uh, I so, but those experiences, like I was directing the the vocal performances, and I wrote it, um, directed the vocal performances, and then um, created the visuals, like by hand. Um, but I didn't want to try to make a feature film without first having dealt with a physical crew. And um, I think that was a very good decision on my part. I I made a short film called The Violation, and um, I would say one of the biggest lessons of that short film was um, you can't like I could do everything making the animated short, but you simply you can't do everything. You have to delegate, and you have to you have to trust people, and you have to be smart about who you, who you uh, put on the crew. I remember an experience um, where, uh, so I, I, uh, I'd done a, a, a low budget horror film called Waxwork back in the 80s. And I really liked the costumer on that and I looked him up and now he had become a big costumer. He has his own warehouse of stuff, but he remembered me and he's like, yes, I'd love to do your, your film. But when he, um, when he showed me what he wanted to do with the costumes, it was like, you know, I know writing and I know acting, but it's like, I know nothing about costumes. And he said, okay, so the, it's a rich family and a poor family. He said, the, the rich family, I'm gonna put them in uh, earth colors. Like they're rooted to the earth. They're pulling power out of the earth. For the poor family, I wanna use unnatural colors. I wanna use neon colors, things that are disassociated. And, um, and so the, the color palette is chaotic. So everything about the rich family rooted and harmless and the poor family who were living in in uh, chaos my main character was in the poor family and i'm listening to this and i'm just like i could never it would never have occurred to me in a million years to even think about 
this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly, the, the image that came into my mind was my arm is 30 feet long. You know, because of you, like I am, my reach is massively extended. And it was the same experience with uh, the cinematographer. Like the ideas, <coughs> like he got the story so well, but I don't know anything about lenses. I know acting, I know writing, I don't know lenses. I don't know cameras, I don't know editing, I don't know uh, focal lengths. Mm -hmm. um, and I had ideas for how I wanted to block things, but the collaboration with him was, was extraordinarily powerful. And um, so it was, you want to have your own ideas, but then you know what you know, and then be clear about what you don't know, and sit back and let people blossom and and grow and and create and um you know when they talk about it being a collaborative process it's not just I, w I would say in a lot of ways it's not even equal it's like the director is even less than because they have a whole massive storehouse of skill and history and information that you couldn't po and one human being couldn't possibly gather it all so that short film turned out extraordinarily well it actually got picked up for a, um, a, a DVD compilation by a, a, a company in the UK called uh, Peccadillo films okay. so um, so then I knew okay I can manage a crew I can um, I can uh, uh, I can make a short film and I felt ready to start working on um, on uh, making my feature, I felt confident enough that I would, had done it right. So. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, great for the audience just to hear. And I always think it's interesting too. So many people that do shorts, they always feel like if they don't go viral and it doesn't, you know, Harvey Weinstein doesn't see it and call him in for a meeting, <laughs> it's somehow a failure. And I think your experience is exactly the experience which I think most people can really learn a lot. It just it prepares them, and there's just a certain amount of just that networking and just. Just the confidence going into a feature film with all that confidence and all the stuff you just described is the real the real power of the shorts. It's not having it go viral and and you know Thank you. launching you into the stratosphere. It's really the more nuts and bolts sort of grounded description of what you just described. And, and if I can add something too, and I, I think this gets lost a lot of times, is it said something I really wanted to say mm -hmm. as an artist. Mm -hmm. It's like, yes, I want to have a big audience. I want to have as many people hear my communication as possible. But there's something, as an artist, there's something nourishing about just creating. You know, yes, you want it to go viral. Yes, you want millions of people to see it. But there's, but your life is also going by. Mm -hmm. And it's like that you... There are things you can control and things you can't control, but it's like one of the things you can control is your communication as an artist. And I look at that film and it's like, I said what I wanted to say and I said it powerfully. Um, I can't make everybody watch it, but enough people did. And it, it actually, as I said, it got, um, it short films, it's very difficult to get distribution um, for, for short films. And, and um, but but to not forget your first job as an artist is to create art. The getting people to see it is is the the second question. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, so. for sure. So let's dig into your feature film um, called The Trigger. Maybe to start out, you can give us a quick logline or pitch. What is that film all about? So it um, uh, there's a a former uh, hustler. He's he's been in jail. And um, he has informed on his uh, on on his drug dealer. He was he was hustling and selling drugs, so he's informed on his drug dealer to get an early release. He knows that this is going to come back and haunt him and destroy him, but he just he's had a horrible home life up to now, and he just wants even if it's just a day, he wants to get his girlfriend, he wants to get his dog, and he wants to get them in an apartment and just feel like this is my family, even if it's just for a moment. And he does do that, and then the, and then things start going to hell. Perfect. So where did this idea come from? What was the genesis of this story? Well, I had a, a ne'er-do-well uh, nephew who's... Um, <coughs> uh, uh, and he was in... Um, it was Christmas Eve, and he was in uh, uh, the juvenile detention center. And uh, so um, this was in Albuquerque, and his family had moved to Pennsylvania, but he came back to Albuquerque to 
sell drugs for these for these people. So I was there visiting him and overhearing this conversation. So you're at like a picnic table. So I'm across from my nephew. My brother and I are across from my nephew. And there's this kid sitting next to me and he's distraught and he's having this conversation with his mother and his mother saying, yeah, your dog bit somebody. There's nothing I can do. You know, they're going to come. They're going to put the dog to sleep. And he's crying. And it's like, could you just hide the dog? You know, put the dog with, you know, with Aunt Susie, put the dog with somebody else until I can get out of here and I'll take care of it. I'll make sure, you know, and she she's like, ah, I'm not going to do that. So you had an hour um, with with uh, the the inmates and she stayed. This is Christmas Eve. She stayed for about 20 minutes and she left. So this kid is sitting next to me crying. And uh, so I had a, a conversation with him. And afterwards, I started to just think about what what is his what is I should let my imagination run wild. Like, who is this woman? Who is this kid? Because he seemed like a perfectly nice kid. It's like, how do you end up here? How do you how do you you know, what does having a mother like that do to you? And uh, that was the, the the genesis for the for the story. Did you get to know him a little bit more? Did you stay in contact? No, no it was just it was just no. this one it was episode. Actually, I would say part of the character is based on um, uh, on him. Part of the character is based on my nephew, and um, and then just you know, as a writer, I think any of the writers listening to this will will know. It's like you're. You're you're moving through life like a magnet, and you're always like picking up pieces of metal. <laughs> you know, you're always like picking up pieces of story, and at some point they start coalescing. So it was stories from a lot of people that I know, stories from uh, you know friends, my own experiences, and um, so the the my life experience just sort of conglomerated mm -hmm. into that into that character. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So let's talk a little bit about your writing process. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Where do you typically write and when do you typically write? Um, what, what was the first part? Where do you typically write? Do you have like a home office or do you go to a coffee yeah. shop? And then when do you typically write? Are you early in the morning, late at night, middle of the night, middle of the day? I do, I do have a home office and um, uh, that is where I write. And uh, generally sometime around Eight nine o'clock at night, people have stopped calling. Um, like any noise outside has settled down, mm -hmm. and uh, there's just the moment where there's no distraction. So I usually write from like maybe nine at night till about three in the morning. Oh, wow! Um, like that's my sort of golden moment of of uh, no distractions. One one of the things that um, uh, as, as far as the process goes, I remember um, reading an interview with Beth Henley, and she's a, a playwright. She wrote um, Crimes of the Heart, and she said, I'd rather drive nails into my head than write. And I was like, oh, like you're so good. And it's like I, I broke my heart that there was so much misery associated with it for her. And I really fight against that. So I do things like um, I... I make sure that I associate joy to it. So I have a playlist of, um, of, uh, of songs that I listen to when I want to, you know, like, like I'll have a, like a hard rock playlist depending on what I'm writing or classical music depending what I'm writing. But I always have music on that I love. Um, I'll have a, uh, um, like, uh, sometimes I'll have like a bag of candy near the desk. Mm -hmm. So it's like every page you get a Tootsie Roll. Um, but it's always like giving my, giving my brain some kind of pleasure all the time during the process to make sure, because it is hard. Mm -hmm. It's going to the gym hard. It's, it, but, <clears throat> but you know, when you're going to the gym, you don't want to concentrate on, ah, I'm so sweaty and miserable and I hate this place. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like, you want to think about, buff <laughs> you know, I'm gonna look I'm gonna look healthy everyone's gonna think I'm sexy you know you the, you keep those thoughts in your mind and then you want to keep going to the gym so you you want to figure out a way to associate joy with with writing all the time and uh, and um, and I mean my case it has definitely worked because I I it's my favorite time hmm. like when I can sit down and start working on a story that I'm passionate about telling. I'm, it's, I'm, I'm thrilled. It is not dr driving a nail into my head. It's like absolute pleasure. Yeah, so. yeah, perfect. And um, 
talk about just the outlining and the preparing versus the actual writing. How much time do you actually spend, you know, outlining, maybe doing index cards versus how much time do you actually spend in final draft writing scene descriptions and character descriptions and dialogue? Well, I would, um, I do spend a lot of time on my first, first what I do is, is a, um, I have a structure guide that I, uh, that I created uh, from a lecture from uh, uh, one of my teachers at UCLA, Linda Voorhees. So I have a, a, what I've created, a, a structure worksheet that basically I, I go through it and I use that to create a beat sheet. So it's really just a series of questions like, um, like you look at your opening hook, like, um, and the, you know, you want your opening hook to raise compelling questions. You want it to um, resonate with the climax. You, I don't, I don't know if this, these are the things that you use, but um but I have a, some some things that an opening hook should do, and uh, so there's opening hook, there's ordinary world, and I, I just think it through, and I, I create a beat sheet out of that structure worksheet, and then from the structure worksheet, I write a three to five page treatment. It's just basically a short story form of what is the story going to be, and importantly, um, I, I learned this in acting. Um, one of my acting teachers said, do a massive amount of preparation, and once you get on stage, forget about all of it, mm -hmm. because you don't know what that other actor is gonna do. You have all your background story, you have all of the power, like uh, he said, you know, if, you, if you're an actor and, and your kitten gets run over, you wanna sit in a chair, you wanna feel that kitten in your hand, what color is it, How, what does the fur on its belly feel like, how much does it weigh? Does it like to be held? Does it struggle in your arms? Like you want to know that kitten so well so that when it gets run over in the movie, you're like, that kitten's real to you. So um, so you have all the background and then you got to dance with what shows up. And um, I, um, so, sorry. Um, so, um, sorry, let me just get, um, so, um, in writing, uh, like I, I, I wrote a script about Nikola Tesla, and I did a massive amount of preparation. There was a book that was written in the 40s, one that was written in the 70s, and one that was written in the 90s. So I read all three of these books about him, did a, uh, an enormous amount of research, did a uh, enormous amount of work on the, on the treatment. But then it was like acting. Once you're actually into the pages, you want to let the characters talk to you. You know, don't be stuck on the don't be stuck on the treatment. Don't be stuck on the beat sheet. Like, let them talk to you. Let them come to life. Let them surprise you. Like, like, I I I think of them almost like ghosts. Like they're whispering to you. They they have a life of their own. And if you've created the background strongly enough, if you've made them three dimensional enough in your mind, in that in that background work, in your in your treatment they will start to live mm -hmm. and you want to listen to them and let them let them go in the direction they want to go and I, I have a lot of students too that are very worried like oh if i write it that way i'm stuck with it it's like no it's it's a first draft mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you're gonna throw out 80 percent of what you put in your first draft don't worry about it like just listen and and be in the process and let them let them run let them let them do the things that they're going to do. Yeah. So. What does your development process look like? So you've written this first draft of the script, and we can even talk specifically about the trigger. Then who did you start to show it to? Do you have a few actor, writer, director friends that you show it to and get notes? Maybe talk through that process and how you handle it. So I, I'm, in a, I, <clears throat> I'm in a screenwriting group. So a group of, of friends we, we, the, that are all screenwriters, we joined, a, we, we joined together and we meet once a week at a coffee shop on, on Wednesday nights for about two and a half hours. So we all bring 10 pages a week. Um, we read them and we critique each other's work. Um, it's also useful in that um, uh, we also exchange, exchange business stuff. So it's like I entered this contest, you know, uh, I... Uh, uh, sent my script into X and X contest. I didn't win, but X and X manager from LA asked me to come out for a meeting. So, so we, um, so being around writers to to discuss art and to discuss business mm -hmm. is is very powerful. And and these guys are, um, we have assembled a, a, a quite a good group of of 
like not only good writers but good hearted mm -hmm. like the kinds of notes that i get are very powerful and and very useful and very supportive how many people are in this group there's seven of us probably four four or five show up every mm -hmm. every single week you know people some people come sometimes sure. and, and don't come up and then you're in austin you said no, this is in uh, this is in Mesa, Arizona. Okay, okay. that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You're in Arizona I, now. Okay. Um, so I, I teach at Arizona State okay. University, um, but this is in a coffee shop near my house. Okay. In, in Mesa. okay, perfect, perfect. Um, so then, what does this look like in terms of getting these notes? So you're going through this process, you're getting notes, um, and then how do you handle that? And I'm talking sort of just maybe more a generic way. If there's something specific with the trigger that you can use to illustrate, um, that might be good. But how do you handle these notes? Um, you must get some notes that you don't necessarily agree with. How do you deal yeah. with those? You must get some notes that you agree with, but maybe feel aren't quite right for this story. Maybe just talk through some of that process of dealing with the notes and how you handle them. Well, I got a, a, I'm going to mention Linda Voorhees again. Um, uh, this professor um, gave me what I think is a brilliant piece of advice, which is when you're getting notes, say yes to everything, <laughs> write it all down. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as, even if it sounds stupid, like write it all down, take all the notes. And then when you go home, it's like you look at the ones that don't make sense to you. And it's like, why did they you know, like, where is that note coming from? Um, because they might not have been able to articulate it well, mm -hmm. um, but they might have a point, even if in, it's not exactly the note you want to take. But when people bump on something in your story, you want to pay attention to that because it's like if they bumped on it, when you turn it into a contest, you turn it over to a producer, somebody else is probably going to bump on it too. I'll give you a quick example. So I, I wrote a, um, a script. Uh, it's a, a kind of a sort of horror movie. But it's a young kid who uh, his father dies and his mother remarries and they have another baby and he becomes obsessed with killing this baby. So um, at one point he... In, in the script, he goes into the baby's room and he's holding a knife in his hand. And the note I kept getting was, um, I've lost my identification with the character. I don't like him anymore. I don't want to be, I don't want to be on this journey with him anymore. And the way the story went, it's like that moment had to happen because so many things, <clears throat> it's like the whole rest of the story built on that moment. And so I couldn't take it out, but I was like, what am I going to do? And uh, he was also convinced he was uh, uh, possessed by a demon. And um, so uh, uh, there's a, a name for Satan, which is the Lord of the Flies. So what I did was he's in his bedroom and he's just like sweating and freaking out. And there's a fly in the room and it keeps flying from him to the door, him to the door, him to the door. So he gets up and he follows it. And then he follows this fly through the house and it goes into the kitchen and it lands on the handle of a drawer and he opens the drawer and then the fly lands on um, on uh, on a steak knife and he picks it up and then he follows it through the house into the into the bedroom so then he's standing there and suddenly it's like that note went away <laughs> it's like because he's he's having hallucinations as well as well in the story so it's like you are it having it happen that way, having him get there that way gave you some distance and, and made it so that you could, you know, it's like you, you remember that he's, he's losing his mind and, um, he may or actually, he may or may not be, uh, uh, possessed by a demon, but you're, you're, um, but the, it was a, a strategy that, that worked. And as I said, the note, the note disappeared. So it wasn't like, <laughs> like I wouldn't tell a writer, you know, just take the note and take the thing out. And it's, it's like a combination of, it is a good note because I do want to know if people lose identification with my protagonist, mm -hmm. that's really bad. Um, but you also don't want to pull the watch spring out of your watch. You know, like there's there, I, I would assert there are ways to address notes that don't undermine the overall structure of your story mm -hmm. and that's an example of of me solving one of one of those things yeah, yeah perfect for sure okay so once you're once you were done with the um the script for the trigger what were those next steps how did you bring on a producer and how did you um guys raise money to actually go out and shoot this movie 
So I, as I said, I teach screenwriting at ASU, and one of my students was a cinematographer. Okay. So um, he, um, he and I, uh, when he graduated, he, he was an older student, and he and I became, uh, became friends. And um, I, uh, I uh, was ready to, to start making a, a feature film. And he was doing, um, he's basically doing local commercials, you know, so they're like casino commercials and, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, commercials for boats that you would take to Lake Havasu and this kind of thing. And he was really unsatisfied uh, um, artistically and he really wanted to, to make a film. And so I showed him the trigger and he got very excited. And so we started talking about, well, how, you know, how could we do this? And uh, I have a friend that actually um, uh, has some money and he was the one who, he he actually uh, gave me the money to make the violation, the short film. So we went to him and the three of us each put in a third of the money. Um, And then again, delegating, um, I knew him I knew he was a good guy. I knew he was very talented as a cinematographer, and he had assembled crews many, many, many times. So um, he, um, so I was able to delegate to him, get me a crew, mm-hmm. and um, then I had a friend who runs an, a website for actors, and I was able to go to her um, to help me put the cast together. Um, but he was, uh, he's a really good guy and he's very, uh, 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 his name is Aiden Chaperone. He's, um, a good human being. Um, and I would say like attracts like, mm-hmm. um, the kinds of people he has around him, the kind of people that he wants to work with are like him. And he's very calm, thinks on his feet. Um, and, uh, he and I were already friends. Um, he get, got me a first AD that um, his name is uh, Phil Click. I've, you know, I'd, as an actor, I'd worked with, you know, a hundred first ADs. I had never met somebody like this before. Like I, you know, we're, so we shot in 18 days. So we're working very, very fast. And, um, and in Arizona he, as well? Yes. Um, so he's incredibly calm. So I could go to him and go, um, I didn't get what I wanted here you know, how, how much time do I have? And if we're out of, you know, he was able to tell me you have time for one more take, you have no time left, or you can get another take here if you're willing to do this entire short scene coming up as a two shot. Um, but he always had three choices. Like he always, he was always thinking ahead, always had a strategy to make sure that I could get what I needed in the can. Mm -hmm. And, um, I would not have known how to find him. So delegating that to, to Aiden mm-hmm. um, uh, got me this amazing uh, this amazing crew. Now he didn't know any actors. I was able to go, you know, in in that direction and, and handle the casting side. Yeah, of it. yeah. And I'm curious, especially as someone like yourself who spent a lot of time as an actor in LA, um, shooting probably all over the country. What do you see as some of the advantages of shooting a low budget film like this in Los Angeles versus the advantage to shooting a low budget film like this in some place like Arizona? Um, maybe maybe there's some advantages and disadvantages you might see. Abs- absolutely. So um, I was very lucky. Um, because of because of Aiden, I was I was able to get the cream of the crop um, uh, crews. Um, uh, there's also an incredible um, like how this happened, why this happened, I don't know. But um, Scottsdale Community College has a film school, and they are producing amazing technicians. Um, and um, but uh, casting the film was extraordinarily difficult. Um, finding um uh find first of all just finding actors period but finding good actors Mm -hmm. was was uh was very difficult so in la you would have you have cream of the crop uh, uh uh crew members who are who are available because there's just so many people in LA, you're gonna be able to put a crew together. I mean, you can't throw a rock in LA without hitting you know, a fantastic crew member in the head. Um, same with acting. Um, they're just every, every amazing actor on earth, they're in LA. And um, so 
as far as securing talent, uh, LA would be the place to go. I did bring one actor, my, my lead, the young, uh, young actor, I brought him in from, from LA. Um, and he was somebody that I had worked with in the violation. So I brought one actor in from out of town, but you got to fly them in, you know, you got to fly them in first class and you've got to put them in a, a, a good hotel. Mm -hmm. And um, that gets expensive, like bringing a whole L.A. Uh, uh, film uh, cast in sure. would be very expensive. So so shooting um, the disadvantages of shooting in L.A. are permitting, um, um, uh, just overall, it's 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 just overall, it's just much more expensive. Um, hiring, you know, the crew is much more expensive. Hiring the actors is much more expensive. So, what I did in, um, uh, I'm a, I'm a um, uh, unapologetic socialist here, um, but uh, the libertarian aspect of uh, of Mesa certainly played in my in my uh, to my advantage because I went into the to the film office of the Mesa government, and uh, which was I think somebody was doing it like as a 16th of their job. And uh, so I went to meet with them. They gave me a piece of paper. I signed it. They printed something out and said, if the police bother you, just show them this. Huh. The end. <laughs> <laughs> no fees, no nothing, no massive paperwork. And it was just a carte blanche, it was just a carte blanche permit to film anywhere in Mesa? Outside, just, inside, just whatever, yeah. dude. Just take, take it easy. <laughs> exactly. So, so that was amazing yeah um, and uh the police did show up one time we were shooting uh uh you know when you're shooting night shots you're starting at sunday yeah. you know sunset you're shooting all night so it was like two three o'clock in the morning and uh we we're shooting a scene in a, in a parking lot and somebody somehow you know we, we two people are arguing in a car and then the car is surrounded by people and somebody said you know there's a fight going on in this parking lot and the police showed up. I showed them my piece of paper. They went. <laughs> um, so um, being left alone is a, uh, I would say, is a big plus, mm -hmm. and not having to pay the fees is a big plus. Yeah. Uh, the one other thing, one other thing I've noticed, um, and I'd be curious to get you as someone who shot in Arizona. Um, you know, in LA, if you go into a coffee shop or a bar and say, "Hey, I want to shoot here," it's like, "Great, it's five thousand dollars a day." You know, <laughs> and it, when you're in, when you're in outside of LA, people just think it's cool to have a movie <laughs> shooting. So you're much more likely to get a restaurant to just give you some food or give you yes. a location. Um, I had a friend who was in Pennsylvania. He went to like the local parks and rec, and the Rangers were happy to just let him shoot. And like, and if you you're in the LA on you know a parking lot. You need the fire marshal, and you need this, and you need a policeman, and you need you know all of this safety stuff, which obviously has its place. But um, for you know low budget guerrilla filmmaking, it just makes it very very difficult. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I um, uh, so I used my house um, uh, for one character's house, and then around the corner, um, which I live in a historic district. So around the corner, I have a neighbor. She owns her house, and she owns the house next door. So. Um, one of the things you want to avoid is big moves. So we were able to just go around the, you know, moving the equipment around the corner is much better than moving it you know, all the way across town. But she was thrilled to like, she thought, oh my God, this is so much fun and making a movie and, and you know, all the equipment in her yard. <laughs> she was like, you know, like in LA, it's like, better not, yeah. you know, you're going to pay for that loan. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, where she was just like having, you know, the time of her life. Um, one of the, um, one of the bad things though about, about, you know, it's $5,000 a day. So the, um, we have a scene set in a pizza parlor and there was a pizza parlor. Um, so I live near, I told you I live in a historic district. So the historic downtown, um, I think it probably collapsed about 40 years ago when they built some shopping mall. So it's been, it's largely empty, but there was a, a pizza parlor there. And, uh, it, you know, it doesn't do great business and because um, it's this ghost town. And I went to them and asked if I could use it. And they said yes. So we show up with the tube, with the with the cube truck uh, the day we're shooting. It's, oh, I'm really sorry. I forgot to tell you we're uh, we rented it out for a wedding. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're shooting in two hours. And I'm like, what am I going to do? So the line producer and I are running up and down Main Street. And there's all these like you know, for lease signs, we're calling, you know, leasing companies, like, can we lease it for the day? Um, 
and we found there was another coffee shop down the street and um he uh he let us use the, his coffee shop for five hundred dollars um which was not we hadn't budgeted for it yeah. so it's a good chunk of change but he let us um uh he let us be in there basically for for all night for two nights hmm. and then and then uh and then one day so again um you, you described like how how fun it is, you know, and I still think, you know, what 30 years in, I think filmmaking is the most fun thing. When I'm acting I, more than once, uh, even recently, people go, is this your first job? <laughs> like, no, I just really like it. <laughs> it's just really fun still. Um, so, uh, um, so, happy the people like in this case they didn't really understand filmmaking like how big of a problem they were creating for me by just sort of backing out as we're unloading the lighting yeah. um but five hundred dollars for you know two and a half days you ain't gonna get yeah, that no, LA. yeah for sure so how can people see the trigger what is the release schedule going to be like so it has just been uh, made available on um on amazon prime okay, perfect and um, if you go to thetriggermovie.com, um, if you don't have Amazon Prime, if you go to thetriggermovie.com, there's a list of other places uh, where you can stream the film. Okay, okay, perfect, perfect. So I'll get, gather all that stuff and round it up for the show notes. And what's the best Thanks. way for people to just keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I'll also put in the show notes. So, the, so thetriggermovie.com is updated regularly. Um, you can uh, go to uh, facebook.com slash the trigger movie um, that has updates about the film, um, you know, interviews, publicity and and uh, uh, things about the film uh, there as well. Okay. So perfect. Perfect. I will round all that up for the show notes. Christopher, I really appreciate your coming on. Um, I'm so happy to have had this conversation. Yeah, with fascinating you. interview. And interview yeah, you're thir real, thoroughly okay. entertaining. So um, so this was a great interview. So I really appreciate okay. it. Thank you. All we'll right. talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. I just want to talk quickly about SYS Select. It's a service for screenwriters to help them sell their screenplays and get writing assignments. The first part of the service is the SYS Select Screenplay Database. Screenwriters upload their screenplays along with a logline, synopsis, and other pertinent information like budget and genre, and then producers search for and hopefully find screenplays they want to produce. Dozens of producers are in the system looking for screenplays right now. There have been a number of success stories come out of the service. You can find out about all the SYS Select successes by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash success. Also on SYS podcast, podcast episode 222, I talk with Steve Deering, who was the first official success story to come out of the SYS Select database. When you join SYS Select, you get access to the Screenplay Database along with all the other services that we're providing to SYS Select members. These services include the newsletter. This monthly newsletter goes out to a list of over 400 producers who are actively seeking writers and screenplays. Each SYS Select member can pitch one screenplay in this monthly newsletter. We also provide screenwriting leads. We have partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads services so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, we've been getting five to 10 high quality paid leads per week. These leads run the gamut. There's producers looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas or properties. They're looking for shorts, features, TV, and web series pilots, all types of projects. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. Also, you get access to the SYS Select forum where we will help you with your logline and query letter and answer any screenwriting related questions that you might have. We also have a number of screenwriting classes that are recorded and available in the SYS Select forum. These classes, these are all the classes that I've done over the years, so you'll have access to those whenever you want once you join. The classes cover every part of writing your screenplay from concept to outlining to the first act, second act, third act, as well as other topics like writing short films and pitching your projects in person. Once again, if this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, please go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that is sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Christopher. He mentioned um, briefly 
Sid Field um, as a book that Sid Field's book is one that he read early on in his screenwriting career. Um, if you haven't read that one, definitely check it out. It's literally called Sid Field's Screenplay. I think Sid Field has a couple of other books as well, but definitely check out Sid Field's Screenplay if you've never read that one. It's real big on screenplay structure and really kind of boils down to the sort of the three act, the very typical three act structure that you find in feature films. Even if you're not super hung up on structure, it's a good overview of how all of this kind of works. So it's definitely sort of one that screenwriting 101 that I would recommend to every person who's starting out as a screenwriter or if you've been at this a while and haven't for whatever reason read it, I would recommend going back and checking that out. I also think it's interesting he's been able to find a good group of writers to meet with regularly. I mentioned my own group at the top of this podcast. Like Christopher, I get a lot out of my screenwriting book, screenwriting group. So even if you're not in LA, you can probably find other like-minded people in your area and I would really encourage you to do that. Um, it just is a great resource. It's a great resource of, of networking and just getting your stuff out there, getting notes, all of the stuff, everything that's involved with the writer's group is just a good thing. You're critiquing other people's material. That helps your own critical thinking skills. It helps you kind of see how other people are coming up with an ideas, how they're executing ideas. It's just very, very valuable if you really sink in and, and, and take part in something like that. One of the other things that I think he said, which made so much sense, was how he was able to get his SAG card while living and working in Texas. Obviously, this is a screenwriting podcast, so we're not necessarily interested in joining SAG or getting our SAG card or anything like that. But I get a ton of emails from people from all over the world wanting to know how to break into Hollywood. And so often I point out that they might be missing local opportunities. Making it in Los Angeles isn't easy. Sure, you've got a lot more opportunities here in LA, but nearly every great writer in the world is here. Like literally the smartest, most talented writer on the planet Earth are here in LA trying to be screenwriters or already are screenwriters. So that's who you are going to be competing with if you move to Los Angeles. Locally, sure, there's a lot less opportunities, but if you are talented enough to make it in Los Angeles, you should have no problem really standing out locally and really maximizing these local opportunities that might exist. And really listen to what Christopher said. By the time he moved to LA, he already had a good number of things going for him. And that's what you can do locally too. You can network a bit. I'm quite sure many local filmmakers know people in Los Angeles and or they might be looking to move to Los Angeles here as well. So if you're thinking of moving to Los Angeles, you might be able to meet someone who is also planning on moving here. You can move out here together. You can get an apartment together. You can share some expenses, that kind of stuff. Obviously, that can be a great resource. You can build your resume. Having a low budget feature film or a few short films under your belt will put you many, many steps ahead of a lot of the people who are rolling into town without any experience whatsoever. So it's again, just another way you can potentially build your resume and it's just not going to be as difficult. It's not going to be that difficult, that difficult locally as it is in Los Angeles, but mainly getting this local experience, it will help build your confidence and make moving to Los Angeles seem a lot more real. You'll be immersed in the in a filmmaking community. It will feel more like the next logical step instead of this sort of pie in the sky shot in the dark. And believe me, when I moved to Los Angeles, I, I am not speaking from experience here. I am speaking from, or I'm not speaking from how I did it. I'm speaking for how I think I probably would have been smarter doing it. I got out of college and I just moved here. And there is something to be said for that because you don't necessarily have any any responsibilities. You know, you, you don't have hopefully don't have a ton of debt. You can just pack up. You can move here. You don't have children. You don't have maybe a spouse. So those things are maybe a little bit easier. There's definitely something to receive that. And if that's the position you're in, fantastic. But if you're not in that position for whatever reason, financially or just your, your family obligations, whatever, and you can't move to Los Angeles immediately, that might be okay. Take advantage of those local opportunities. Network locally. Find that filmmaking community in your local area. And all of that can really help as a springboard to moving to Los Angeles. And again, doing these local opportunities, it will ultimately make it more likely that you will actually move here eventually because, again, you'll have that confidence, you'll have that experience, and it will feel much more like a next logical step. It can be these local opportunities can be a great low stress, low risk way of starting to build a screenwriting career. So don't overlook them if you can if you can find out how to network with these people. Um, definitely take that seriously. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.